All right, welcome to my newest series. Uh, in this series, we're going to be tackling the lovely little game, Mice and Mystics. This is a dungeon crawler with a nice, lighthearted, uh, perhaps innocent story that to me recalls, at least in feel or vibe, um, in addition to kind of a somewhat classic RPG, almost D&D-like kind of feel. It's, it's kind of that blended with something like the old Don Bluth film, Secret of Nim. Very, um, of course, you're, you're going to be dealing with uh, anthropomorphized characters. You're going to be in control of some mice heroes, and they're going to be running around with swords and bows and casting magic spells and um, there's, there's great big beasts like the house cat that kind of fill the role of the dragon, as it were, in your kind of typical Dungeons and Dragons kind of arc or plot line. And it, it really is just a delightful little romp through a very well told story that hinges on a relatively... I don't want to say hackneyed, but uh, kind of well-trod ground in the fantasy genre. You are going to be in charge of a party of people who are attempting to save the kingdom from the machinations of an evil sorceress who has the king under a spell, and so on and so forth. It's, it's as with most stories, less about a you know, especially novel plot arc and more about the telling of the story. And this is a very well-told story, so I find it quite delightful. It is a dungeon crawler, and what that means for anyone not familiar with the term is, and the, the name recalls something like Dungeons and Dragons, but basically the kind of, even though in, in my, you know, I've played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, and in my experience, actual dungeons worthy of the name are few and far between in at least the games I play. But it's still a kind of classical or canonical, maybe trope might be a good word for it, um, for Dungeons and Dragons, where you have a bunch of people who are just kicking in a bunch of doors and killing a monster in this room, kill a monster in that room, kill a monster in that room. And you're running through this, you know, sequence of chambers with baddies in them. Hence the name Dungeon. Now, in Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to be tromping through sewers and you're going to be finding a warren of caves up in the mountains. You're going to be delving into the wizard's tower trying to get to the top and things like that. So even if they're not quite dungeons, you still have something that mechanically might be very similar to that. And there's a category of board games called Dungeon Crawlers that kind of go in line with this. You bop from room to room, you fight enemies in those rooms, you loot the bodies, as it were, and move on. Um, and there's usually an element of an RPG where you are advancing your characters as they gain experience, they get more powerful, and so forth. This is very much in that line. Uh, it is going to be a game in which your party of mice is making their way through a series of chambers in the musty old castle with the ultimate goal of foiling the schemes of the evil sorceress, saving the king and the kingdom in the process. What is new or somewhat unique about it is you start out in the story at least as human beings but once the sorceress has thrown you in jail for questioning what's going on in the kingdom your only recourse is to have the court wizard turn you into mice so that you can slip away through the sewers to freedom the problem of course being that he lacks the ability to turn you back into people, and as a result, for the duration of the game, you will be in mouse form. Now, the sorceress, of course, has her own magical powers, and so she sends rats and other baddies scurrying after you, 
and in later chapters she might actually take a certain form to harry you as well so you spend most of the game fighting things like rats and roaches and centipedes but you are going to be progressing through a series of 11 chapters if you play the campaign and the overall arc again is to accomplish the defeat of the sorceress each chapter is going to have its own objective and you're going to in the pursuit of that objective march your way through a series of chambers in most chambers you will have an encounter with a series of enemies that must be um, you know overcome before moving on to the next chamber hence it is in many ways a simple dungeon crawl the mechanics and rules are relatively simple and yet they are presented in a rule book that while beautiful is in my opinion not the best not the clearest um, there are several rules that are scattered throughout the book you've got half here on page 10 and the other half is on page 16 and there's nothing on page 10 that necessarily tells you to look for the rest on page 16 or vice versa so you will sometimes find especially because there are also simplifications of the rules in certain places or the abandonment of rules in certain places there are going to be as a result of that times when you're flipping through the rule book and you're just not sure if you're not finding that rule do you remember seeing it were you simply thinking it was logical and you were expecting the rule to be there but there isn't a rule maybe you know the rules in there somewhere but you can't freaking find it for the life of you um it, it's kind of actually frustrating until you learn the rules to deal with that rule book the storybook is a little bit better but it too has its drawbacks in this the 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 realm of clarity it's beautifully presented it's a, it's a piece of eye candy unto itself and once you get used to it once you get it figured out it's really not that hard but the initial learning curve is you know it's not it's not like learning mage knight or anything but it is much harder than it needs to be and much harder than it should be for a game that is this relatively simple at its core this is your classic dungeon crawler uh, some people like to throw around the term ameritrash I'm not a big fan of that term but um, <clears throat> we are looking at a heavy amount of dice being chucked there are in some people's minds uh, too many dice being thrown in this game I don't find it to be a problem some people find it to be a slog in certain situations you're just grinding your way through room after room I have never once felt that and I have played through this game many many times I find it very compelling just you know I guess I just get lost in the aesthetic and the vibe the feel and while it is not especially challenging in the sense that in order to be successful you need to have in-depth strategy or anything like that you can simply walk in and chuck dice and win the game you can have incredibly good strategy and the dice don't fall your way and you're going to lose that game the luck is much bigger of a factor in this game than for the most part your strategy but there is a great deal of strategy and a surprising amount of depth that can be used for the sake of slightly increasing your odds here or there and at times perhaps making the difference between victory and defeat certainly might be making the difference between a level up here or there a good piece of equipment being kept here or there or a little bit less stress <laughs> getting through the chapter um, so it's a wonderful game I love the heck out of it it is a absolute labor of love on the part of the creators and you're gonna see this as we work through the the artwork and general presentation of this game it's just gorgeous but it's a little harder to learn than it should be and while kids would probably enjoy it I wouldn't recommend playing it with kids that are any younger than maybe six or seven and even then they're gonna need a lot of help from you if you guys are to be uh, playing it correctly 
uh, there's there's really no chance that a five or six or seven year old is going to be able to manage this game by themselves without having played it several times first. Just because of the again the presentation and the the sometimes needlessly complex presentation of the rules is going to get in the way. But if you're able to help out a kid, they definitely could enjoy this. That said, it's by no means a kid's game in the sense that uh, adults also adore this game. I play this solo. I play it with friends. I have never played it with a kid, and I still love playing it, which is why I've decided to do a video series on it. I love playing it. Might as well play it and press record while doing so. So um, that, that pretty much is where I'm coming from in terms of how the game works, what it's all about, and my general sentiments on it. Once we are completed with this brief rules introduction, I'm going to go through absolutely all of the rules, so it will take a little bit of time, but I'm going to try to go through it as quickly as possible. And then in subsequent videos, I'm going to play through one chapter per video for the entire 11 chapter campaign. And each of those is probably, I would estimate, going to take something in the order of 90 minutes to complete one of those chapters. But uh, we'll see how quickly I can get through the rules. I will probably table some of the complexity and leave it to be brought out in gameplay as it comes out. But I will attempt to go through all of the rules, especially the rules that I know from watching the forums and such that tend to confuse or stymie new players. Again, because of the presentation or the counterintuitiveness of some of the rules and rule simplifications. There's some asymmetries there that are not necessarily going to make for a lot of clarity. So hopefully you'll be able to watch through this and not need to do much with the rule book afterwards, but make a few references in order to play the game through um, properly. And of course, have fun doing so. So with all that on the way, let's, uh, let's dive into what we're going to be doing in order to make this presentation possible in the recording of this video, and then we'll dive into the rules. All right, so you're looking here at the program I'm going to be using to play the game. And I've chosen to, as I have in previous videos, use a digital format for the recording. Uh, and the reasons are the same. Basically, if I was to use a video camera, I would be zooming in and out and moving it around and, I don't know, Personally, whenever I watch videos like that, I get disoriented and dizzy. The only time when I'm able to watch games being played, I really need to have the cameras be set up on like tripods. And it's just, it becomes a whole production to do it well, moving tripods around and repositioning, cutting and splicing, and it's more effort than I'm willing to put in to create. Plus, this gives me a chance to show off a little creation here, so there's a little bit of an agenda as well. What you're looking at here is a program called MapTool, slightly older version of MapTool, but it's pretty indicative of the program. And kind of like something like a program such as Microsoft Word or another word processor, You've got the program itself, but when you open it up, you're staring at a blank document. There's not a lot there. MapTool is a lot like that. MapTool is a virtual tabletop program that allows you to have a map, run certain code, have a chat box to um, go back and forth and chat with people, obviously, as chat boxes do. You're able to link up on the internet, so there is a shared map that everybody can kind of share. There's a chat box that everybody can share, but you can also have private windows. You can whisper to people. Basically, at the end of the day, it is an opportunity for players to connect remotely over the internet and play games as if they were sitting around a table, hence the term virtual tabletop. It is unlike something like Tabletop Simulator, not three-dimensional in the strictest sense, and it is not going to have any 
physics for chucking dice or anything like that. I've used Tabletop Simulator in the past, but I actually don't care for it much for the playing of most board games. Oddly enough, one of the more difficult board games with a vast number of components, Mage Knight, is one of the few that actually I find does work well on Tabletop Simulator, and that is in large part because you don't spend much time rolling dice or moving pogs around. You're really spending most of your time looking at cards, so you get a layout of cards, and if those cards are scripted, so much the better. So that's that's why it works great for Mage Knight. Not so much for Mice and Mystics. There are mods out there if you're interested, but I find them to be really tedious to use. What I'm going to be using instead is a framework for map tool that I have put together for the playing of Mice and Mystics. Now, this is, as I mentioned, a little bit like loading a novel into a word processor. You open the word processor, there's nothing there. You have to have the file that you can open up in it before you can see any content. So all this content that you're seeing, for the most part, is created by me and is part of a framework file that I have to load into Map Tool. And unfortunately, it's not something that I can share. For copyright reasons, I am not able to share this file, which would enable people to download and play the game for free. And that obviously is not something that um, legally is okay. So I am not going to be able to make this available. It's not available on the map tool forums or anything like that, so don't go looking for it. It is something I did uh, actually approach Plat Hat Games about. I offered it to them basically. Hey, I put this together for my own, you know, shits and giggles. If you want it, it's yours. Uh, they politely declined, and that's that. So it's for me to play. I sometimes play with my friends. I own the game, so I'm not dodging anything there. But, you know, I, uh, I've actually gotten people to buy the game in virtue of having tried it out with me here. And more importantly, I can play this game wherever I am with just a laptop, which is kind of nice if I'm out traveling or something like that. For the most part, it's going to be visually what you would see on uh, your table so everything that I'm doing here should translate pretty pretty well pretty easily with a couple of exceptions um, so the, fu the fundamental rules here are such as you can see you're gonna have in your case you're gonna have minis on a cardboard map I have a digital map and I have these little image pogs to represent the minis but I'm going to drag them around on the map and place them to indicate their movement and it's really going to be just like positioning minis on the map. You would have a stat card. I have an overlay here for some of the information and I have a status window that I can open up to show me things like their bio, how many hit points they have, what their special abilities do, a little bit larger printout of their stats, and then I can also look at their abilities and their equipment and so forth to check out. And that's going to basically be what you would have in front of you in your, as it were, your player board, your player area, as you were uh, controlling a mouse going about the game. Now the mice are going to be assembled into parties of varying sizes as you go through the game. You're going to have parties of two, four, or six mice in various chapters. Most of them are going to be four. So that's actually a little bit of something you need to kind of take into account if you're planning on playing the campaign. If you have four people, that's great, but there is one chapter where only two mice are in it. So what do the other two people do is going to be a question for you. There are other chapters when there are six mice that are going to be playing at one time. So again, who's controlling the extra mice? It's something that can be played solo. So I play controlling two, four, or six mice myself. Um, or you can play it with two players and have the burden shared that way. But basically, just be aware of the fact that there will be some chapters where the party size is not four, even if most of them are. In each particular chapter, you're going to be going through a series of chambers and rooms in a map that is laid out in the storybook 
and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But you're going to be going through a series of chambers in order to reach an objective, accomplish some sort of victory condition, and do so before you've hit the defeat conditions. Generally speaking, there are going to be two ways in which you can lose the scenario. And that is either the entire party gets captured in what is sometimes referred to as a TPK or a total party kill. Um, of course, we're talking, it's a, I guess, has a kid's aesthetic, so they talk about getting captured rather than killed. But same difference, basically. You are, when the whole party is defeated, game over. The other way in which you're generally going to lose the game is if you run out of time. Now, time in this game is tracked in a nifty little way uh, that is somewhat represented or a little bit more abstractly represented in this framework. So I will bop over in just a second to an alternative uh, picture to show you how it's going to work for you at table. But basically, in every single chapter, you're going to have a set of victory conditions that is going to vary from chapter to chapter. But generally speaking, it's going to involve get to the final room and clear it of enemies, maybe while having to do something along the way or in that last chamber before you do so. That's generally speaking what it is going to involve most of the time. And again, most of the time, all you're worried about doing is not running out of time and not getting everybody killed. It's, in that sense, relatively straightforward, although the layout and the particulars of every chapter are variable and interesting. All right, so when you're at the table, you're going to have a couple of cardboard pieces that clip together in the middle. And when they're assembled, they look like this. And it's uh, what's called the storyboard or the story control board. There's a couple of things on here. Of course, this is where you're going to have your cheese wheel, which we'll get to in a while. And it's where you're going to put your encounter and your search decks, which will be important as you play through. But the two things you're probably going to interact with most are going to be the chapter track and the initiative track. And that's what I want to get to now. Uh, again, because we're going to treat it differently in map tool than you would see at the table. The way initiative works is essentially all the mice in your party are each going to have a card as you see here and it's going to have their stats on it which you will have on their character card in front of you anyway but it's there just because um, and then the enemies are also going to have um, their own cards and that's actually where you're going to find their stats they don't have character cards with them so you're going to refer to their cards to find them and they're going to have traits as well so I guess just because it's on the enemies, it might as well print it on the good guys too, so they have the same format. But basically, everybody's going to have their own card. You're going to have one card for each type of enemy on the or in the combat. And essentially, you are going to have things put in whatever order they happen to be in, and we'll talk about that in a second. But basically, as you're playing through the game, that will determine the order in which people go. You start at the start at whoever's in the one spot, and then you move to the two spot, the three spot, the four spot, etc. When the last person has had a turn, you cycle back up to the top, and away you go. Now, when there are no enemies on the board after you've defeated everything, um, whenever something comes off, everybody just slides up. And if you have defeated all the enemies, you actually continue taking turns with your mice in this order, and the only thing that really um, turns on that is in order to keep you moving every time your last guy in initiative takes a turn and there are no enemies and you cycle back up to the top, you are adding cheese to the, to the wheel, which can do bad things. So that, that's a way of enforcing you to keep moving when you're not in combat, basically. So you don't just kind of sit around and milk every single room without consequences. Now, when you start a combat, and there, we'll get into how uh, encounters are set up, etc. later, but when you start a combat, when you add an enemy to the initiative track, when there are no enemies currently in the initiative, then what you do is you pick up all of the cards off the track, and you shuffle them up, 
and then randomly draw them to put them back onto the track. I'm obviously not shuffling, but uh, you would, let's just assume this is a result of a shuffle with uh, when a new encounter takes place. Then boom, we have the new initiative order and we go right up to the top and start taking turns at that point. If by contrast, suppose you're in the middle of a fight and enemies have joined in, which can happen, then they are always going to be placed at the end of the chapter of uh, the initiative track and rounds are just going to continue. Now that sounds like it might be a good thing for you, but it's often not. The reason being, you don't know where in the initiative order you're going to be when that card is added to the bottom. For instance, suppose Filch is the one who triggered the event causing the roaches to appear. Well, if they go right there on the bottom, as soon as Filch is done, they're going next. Now, if it was Lily's turn, great, you got a lot of time before those roaches act, but you just, you basically don't know. Another element of this is, if you see here, the rat warriors, both the elite and the regular, have this aggressive trait, and that basically states that after they take a turn, they will move up in the initiative order so that they can go sooner when the initiative come back, comes back around. You're also going to have a couple of uh, things that might affect where people are in the initiative. Colin has a skill that allows him to swap places with somebody in the initiative order. Um, Filch has a, an ability on his dagger that um, references whether or not he's higher on the track than the enemy that he's attacking. So for instance, if the roaches were here, he would have that advantage against the roaches, but not against the rat warriors. And if the rat warriors started below him, but they moved up, then he would at that point lose whatever the advantage he had on that basis. But that's basically the core mechanics and that just allows you to kind of keep cycling through and taking turns accordingly. When you're on a enemy uh, card, you basically are going to move all the figures associated with that card. So all the rat warriors would go at once. And then when it comes turn to the roaches, all the roaches would go at that point. Now you'll sometimes have enemies that actually have multiple cards. So boss enemies like Brody and Vanestra have multiple cards. And what you're gonna do there is if, again, if you are putting everybody down on the track uh, at one time, because in, at the time in which you're adding the enemies, there were no enemies on the track, that triggers a, sh a complete reshuffling of all the initiative cards. Well, then you're just going to shuffle those multiple cards into the deck and put them down accordingly. But if you are adding, suppose Brody is triggering as a surge, right? Suppose we are um, adding enemies. Well, if if you add Brody's cards, he's got two of them. So let's just pretend these are these are two Brody cards. Uh, rather than putting both cards at the bottom of the track, what you do is you put them both down and then you roll a die for the top card and you'll therefore get a number between one and three and you'll move it up that number of spaces so there's at least one space in between his two cards so that he's not you know kind of um rapid firing going twice right in in rapid succession it's a way to scatter the cards up a little bit in the initiative order and that's actually a uh, aspect of one of the types of encounters you can have called an ambush which essentially does the same thing. You, uh, at that point, you might be shuffling, and when you're when you're putting all the cards down to start an encounter, you then go to the enemies, roll a die, and move them up. And that's basically to reflect the fact that you've been ambushed, so the enemies have a chance of going a little bit faster than they otherwise would. And that's pretty much how initiative works. Now I mentioned the timing element that controls whether or not you are um, going to win or lose the chapter, as well as what types of encounters you're going to be getting from encounter cards, which we'll cover when we get to the encounter cards mechanic. But basically each chapter is going to have the, um, you have this marker here called the, the end. And again, this is in keeping with the uh, storybook kind of ideology here um, or theme. And so for instance, in chapter one, you, you place that at on page six. And the hourglass is always going to begin on page one, as you would expect. And basically, as things go through, you're going to have uh, opportunities to advance the hourglass marker. 
I say opportunities, but you're really not given a choice. And generally speaking, it's a bad thing um, because basically once this reaches the end, you've lost. So you need to accomplish your victory conditions before this marches up to the end. It's really that simple. There are a couple of things that make this move up, but the two big ones are anytime you trigger a surge, which we'll cover in a, in a bit, and also anytime a mouse in your party is captured for any reason. So there's a couple of things that can move this up. And as a result, if you really you know, fail hard in a combat, you get a couple of mice captured, you're already advancing a two or three pages, especially if you triggered a surge, one single tile could cost you three, um, three pages in your, your story. And that's not a lot of time if you're only starting with six. Some chapters you start with five, you might start on seven. Now there are a couple of mechanics that um, you know, during, during the course of the game, you might accomplish something awesome, and part of your reward is you're able to move this up one. You might be able to draw a special card in the search deck, which allows you to move this backwards one. But they're relatively rare, and as a result, for the most part, you're going to walk into a chapter and know you can trigger this five times, but not six, unless something good happens, because otherwise you have lost. That's Again, a nice, relatively simple mechanic. That's how it works in the game. And that's the bulk of the, uh, the storyboard here. You're going to have uh, space in the middle here where you can store tokens for your party items. Things like the, uh, the catnip, the grapes, the fish hook and thread, and stuff like that. You can kind of check them here because any member of your party can grab it. So it's a nice, convenient place for all of the party items to be stored. That's the storyboard. Let's pop back to the map. So again, as we play through the game here in Map Tool, we're going to have this represented up here in this corner. We've got the cheese wheel just because that's a nice, simple graphic to display. But we don't need a whole big thing with cards um, in, in Map Tool. We can just have the page end and the current page listed with simple numbers, nice and simple. We're going to throw down the encounter card right here. When we have one in play, it'll be face up. If there are treachery cards which you need to play, place over there, we'll put them here. We'll see those as they come up. And then the initiative is right here. Essentially, we're just going to keep, you know, we're, it's, it's just like you saw on the initiative track. We're going to shuffle up enemies and we're going to roll through and then cycle back up to the top. We're going to be able to move cards around by just clicking and dragging and things like that. Um, this is just built right into Map Tool. And uh, there's, there's code that allows you to interact with it. So with the click of a button, I can shuffle the initiative and away we go. So it's nice and easy and this will replace the storyboard so we don't have to bop back and forth between a big graphic and we can just focus on the map and have a visual right off to the side. So now that we've covered initiative, what do we do on our turn? Well. Uh, as we mentioned, it's a lot like D&D in that you are going to have essentially, you know, it's oversimplifying things for D&D, but basically you've got a move action, and then you have in D&D what's called the standard action, at least in 3.5, and here it's basically you have a move and an action. And on your turn you get one of each, but there are a lot of different things that you can do with each of these. So I'll just run through these. Basically... Move, we're going to come back to exactly how it works, but when you move, you move around on the map. I mean, I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. You also are going to have a bunch of free actions that you can, uh, um, you can take advantage of and that don't count as either a move or an action. They're, they're free, so you can kind of do them in the middle of your turn, and they don't really cost you anything. And we'll cover all of those in a second. But your core actions, other than moving, are... You can battle, which means you attack an enemy with either a melee or a ranged attack. You can scurry, which is move again. In DD terms, it would be a double move. You uh, are going to have some abilities that you are going to get as you level up. And again, we'll talk about abilities in a bit. And the card that you're playing at that time will specify whether or not it is going to move up. Uh, sorry, in order to use it, you have to spend a move or use up your action. Or if it doesn't specify, the implication is that it's a free action. Although sometimes, again, it will specify that as well. But, you know, you have an ability and it might say, as, a, as an action, you can do this. You're also going to be able to search, 
which is essentially you're going to root around in the garbage on the tiles and find stuff that helps. It's almost always helpful. Sometimes it's bad. About one time in ten it's, it's bad. Um, sometimes you have to do this in order to advance the story because there are critical story items in various places. And sometimes there are special search items in special search places on special maps. We'll cover all of that as they come up. You can spend your action to recover, which is an action used to resist conditions like stun, try to break out of being entangled in a web, that sort of thing. Basically, you're trying to clear a status condition. You can also explore, which is the mechanic by which the mice advance from one tile to another or from one face of a tile to the opposite face of the tile. And then at times it will require you to spend your action in order to pick up an item that isn't one that you necessarily need to search in order to find, but which has been placed on the map. So an example would be the fish hook. You guys have the fish hook, you've used it, which means you place it on the map. If you want to collect it before you move on so you don't lose it, you're going to have to spend an action to pick that sucker back up. Now there are also, so that's, well, that's basically a rundown of all the things that count as actions. So again, in D&D terms, your standard actions. You also have free actions. Now free actions are interesting in that you can do as many of them as you want and they count for completely for free and they don't count towards your action, they don't take up your move or anything like that. But each one of them, you can only do once on your turn. So uh, some examples of this would be equipping an item that you have in your pack. Another example would be sharing or trading items between mice. Another example would be spending a bunch of cheese that you've collected in order to level up. And again, we'll come back to that mechanic. Certain items that you use, for example, most of the scrolls, perhaps all of the scrolls, as opposed to picking up the fish hook, placing the fish hook on the map. All of these are free actions. And you could actually do all of them. You could conceivably equip something, give a friend some cheese, spend some cheese to level up, and drop the fish hook, and cast a scroll all on your turn. And then you could attack, and then you could move. So you could do all of that. But what you could not do is share with two different mice because that would involve using the share action twice. You couldn't level up twice even if you had the cheese to do so as far as I understand it. Now, what's complicated about this is, again, just you kind of have to keep track about what you're doing. Um, and then one, one other complication is that when it comes to equipment, my understanding of the equip action is it allows you to kind of just, as it were, decide what you want to have equipped. So it's not a separate equip action to put away a sword and then another equip action to draw your bow. Just your equip action is just swapping your bow for your sword or vice versa. Similarly, when you share with another mouse, it basically think of it as opening up a trade negotiation with the other the other player, the other mouse, and you guys can just freely exchange any items or cheese that you want between yourselves. And then when you're done, as it were, you close that window and the transaction's completed. That's your share action. So you can share as much as you want between two mice on your turn. But you can't then go and trade with somebody else also. Because that would involve using the share action twice. So it, well, the way I have this coded here, you'll see this. Obviously, at, at table, you would just be handing cards back and forth with another player, but I have what I called it a trade, but it's basically a trade action. I pick the mouse I want to trade with, let's just say Filch, and you can see I've got all of Filch's equipment, all of Colin's equipment, and I can just decide who gets what, and if either of them had cheese, I could decide whether I'm giving or taking cheese, and basically, once that's done, I just hit OK, and all of the changes are made. So let's talk about moving on the map. First thing to note about moving is that when you move, there is a bit of a move, uh, roll to move mechanic here. Uh, some people don't like it, but um, you know it does certainly add a, a element of unpredictability to the game. Your planning can only take you so far, and there's a certain amount of tension at times that comes of it. You know, if you really need to move a certain amount, you have to kind of hope you can sometimes. But basically, you are going to have a stat, and you'll notice when I mouse over any of these mice, 
they each have a battle defense lore and move stat. Those are your core stats, and we'll talk about them in a minute, although they're pretty self-explanatory. But the move stat is basically the number of hexes you're going to be, or number of spaces you're going to be able to move on top of what you roll. So just as an example, suppose we're moving Lily here. She just, in order to roll her movement, she rolls. In this case, she rolls a one. She adds that one to her movement stat of two, and that tells her she can move three spaces. She can roll anywhere from one to three on the die, and we'll talk about how the dice work, but basically you're gonna get a number between one and three, and you're gonna add it to your move stat. So she's always moving at least three, and she's moving up to five on her turn in virtue of having a two movement. Now, when you move, you are basically just counting spaces. So one movement here, 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 etc., for a movement of uh, of five. In this case, as we said, she could only move three, so she could go here, 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 or she might go from here, she might say one, two, three, for whatever reason, etc. Um, the maps, you're basically going to just eyeball. It's not a um, neat and tidy grid like you see on a lot of maps. It's not a hex pattern or anything like that, but basically the artwork is going to make it pretty clear what's a space and what's not. The one complication with this, though, is the game designer has kind of left a couple of things up to your discretion. So the one rule that is definitely in place is adjacency. You can move into an adjacent space, and what determines adjacency is when you take your figure for your mice, take a small figure, which is any of the roaches, any of the mice, any of the rats, they're going to have a standard base underneath them. And if that base can span the distance between two spaces, and it's not passing through like a, a wall or something like that or a red line, then those are considered adjacent and you can move from one to the other for the point, uh, the cost of one movement. Now, that's clearly going to be the case here. Is it the case here? It looks like maybe not. And this is where it kind of becomes a little bit murky because it also says that you may decide that terrain features will block either your line of sight. So for instance, for ranged attacks, if I've got an enemy over here, does this helmet mean I can't see that guy to shoot at him? I would tend to say yes. You might think it means you can't move onto that space, but the storybook in chapter one is gonna tell you that this is a search space. So as a result, obviously because you can only search in a space if you're on it, that would seem to imply that unless they're just wasting everybody's time declaring that to be a special spot, that the mice can get in there. But you might rule as a group that maybe you can only enter that space from here and then you can only leave from one of these places because you're crawling inside the helmet from the neck, maybe. Um, I generally don't go to that level of detail, but you're going to have to decide as a group. And the designer has kind of made this explicit. He wants you to have these conversations and just kind of play how, how you want. He's, he's kind of keeping this rules light a little bit. Some people find that a little too hands-off, um, and they like nice and clean-cut rules. But basically, you're going to have to decide as a group if that's a legal move uh, or not. You're also going to have to decide whether or not the torch or the helmet or whatever is blocking line of sight. There really aren't specific rules for this other than that adjacency rule that I mentioned. And then there are some rules regarding uh, difficult terrain, but we'll come to that later. Basically, you are going to have a move stat, you roll your die, and then you're going to count off the number of spaces. The enemies that you're facing are going to work basically the exact same way, except they do not have a movement stat. So when they move, they are always moving one, two, or three spaces, and the amount is, uh, as it turns out, equally likely. So they have one in three chance of moving one, two, or three spaces, and you just kind of never know. But you can bank on it and kind of play your odds accordingly. If you're keeping your distance, uh, maybe you're three moves away from getting attacked. Maybe that factors into a decision that you're making because he's only got a 30% chance of reaching you and doing any damage. Another aspect of this is that, well, I mentioned there are, there are terrain complications, and we'll cover some of them in a bit. Things like water and um, 
difficult terrain, like you have to clamber up at the side of a chair, so it requires extra movement to get onto that space, that sort of thing. Um, there are rules for you that the enemies basically just ignore. So the enemies move around in order to, I guess the intention here is to try to keep it simple, but also try to keep it so that you can't really exploit the enemy AI too much and offset the fact that you do have a movement advantage um, by everybody having a movement stat. So what they've done is basically said the enemies just move on the grid and they kind of ignore all terrain features. It's no problem at all for them to cross even the red lines uh, and they move as though a big stream of water isn't even there. Um, it seems a little bit weird. It, I do find that it defeats immersion a little bit, but it is also true that it vastly simplifies the, uh, for want of a better word, the AI mechanics for the enemies. This is a co-op game. There is no overlord running the bad guys, and therefore it, it allows the game to just have a nice simple mechanic for moving all the enemies and keep this from turning into a you know, a real slog. So I think uh, on balance, it's actually a good idea, although sometimes it can seem a little unfair. So minion rules at a glance. Basically, you have any minion that you're facing. And minion's the catch-all term for the bad guys, even for bosses. They're boss minions, I believe, which is kind of weird. Um, but yeah, any minion that you face is going to move that one, two, or three spaces. And there are going to be very simple rules for what they're doing on their turn. They're never going to move twice. They're always only going to attack once. They're not, generally speaking, using special abilities or anything like that other than just what is their standard means of attacking you, and that will be on their card. But basically, they are going to, if they are, they're, they're either going to be melee or ranged. And if they are melee, they're just going to try to get to the closest mouse they can and then start attacking. So they're very mindless in that respect. They just move until they hit a mouse and then keep move. you know, they, they stop moving when they're in the same space as a mouse and they keep attacking and keep attacking. Uh, ranged enemies will not move unless they don't have an enemy, uh, you know, from their perspective, an enemy to shoot at. If there's no mouse that they can shoot at, then they will move towards the closest mouse until they get a mouse that they can shoot at, at which point they will stop and start shooting. Bosses are going to have very special rules. Sometimes the um, enemy won't really move except according to the rules. So for instance, Brody has kind of his own uh, section in the rulebook. Brody's the house cat that guards the castle, right? And, um, you know, he, he basically has a couple of special rules for his two cards and they each work differently. So he's kind of bouncing around the map according to his own rules rather than following the standard rules. But for the most part, enemies are just going to move and bite you, move and hit you with a sword, or just stay back and shoot at you with bows and arrows. Now, combat in this game works as follows. First of all, um, you have the game is going to come, the core game is going to come with a set of five dice. The larger expansion, Downward Tales, comes with another set of five dice, and I believe you can purchase additional dice if you want. But I have not found that you have a rough time getting by with just the five dice that are included, as long as you can hand them back and forth across the table. There is a good bit of dice rolling, so it is convenient. I find it's very nice to have the extra five dice from the expansion. Um, I can't say I've ever needed more than that. You can have one kind of set of dice for each side of the table, and you should be fine. Um, but un unlike too many, you know, a game like Too Many Bones or even Descent, where you got like 600 million different kind of dice, uh, Too Many Bones, when you open that up, it's like a just great wall of China of dice. Um, <laughs> but this, this game just comes with a five, but they're busy. Um, now, what's interesting about this is each face has a lot going on. In fact, I can go into our um, tables here and show you kind of what they look like. We've got um, six faces on the dice. We've got one that's just a wedge of cheese with the number one. We've got a bow with a star on it with a number one. We've got a bow with no star and a number two, and so on and so forth. And those are the six faces on the die. They're standard six-sided dice. And you can see there's two ones, two twos, two threes. There's one cheese, two bows, three swords, two shields, and three stars scattered about. Now, when you're rolling, 
So for instance, we covered movement. When you're rolling for move, you, all you're paying attention to is the number on the die. You don't care if you get a sword and shield or a bow. It just doesn't matter. You're just looking at the two or the one or whatever it is that you rolled. In combat, depending on what you're doing, you're looking to accomplish different things. Basically, if you are making a melee attack, you want to get a number of successes equal to, and you're going you're gonna to roll a certain number of dice determined by your character's abilities and the items that they're using, any special abilities they might have fired off, etc. So circumstances are going to dictate how many dice you're rolling, and each die might or might not have what you're looking for on it. So for instance, when you make a melee attack, you want to get swords. If you're rolling four dice, you might get four swords, you might get no swords, you might get two swords. It really just depends on your luck. But you're going to count the number of swords that you rolled. And outside of special conditions, that's really all that you care about in terms of making your attack. Now, you might have a special item that gives you bonus damage when you roll a particular face on the die or something along those lines. But the core mechanic here is you roll dice, you count your number of swords. That's the number of successes or hits that you've rolled. The defender will then roll dice and they're going to be looking for shields in order to accomplish defense. And at that point they don't care if they're rolling swords with stars or anything like that. They just care about rolling shields. So as a result they are going to roll again depending on the circumstances a certain number of dice and they're going to count how many successes they've got. If the attacker has any successes that are not countered by defense successes, I like to say hits that then get blocked, right? Uh, basically, any unblocked hits count as a wound. Now, mice and certain enemies can take multiple wounds. Think of it as hit points. Most of the mice have three. One of the mice has four. Most of your enemies either are going to have one hit point, in which case their card probably won't have any um, indication of how many hit points they have, and it's basically just understood to be one. Um, other bosses might have three, or large enemies might have three or four hit points on their card, indicating that they can take multiple wounds before they're defeated. But basically each unblocked hit counts as a wound, and most of the enemies you're going to be facing will be killed by a single wound. Your mice get captured when they run out of wounds. Now, similarly, bows are what you're going to be rolling for when you make a ranged attack. You want to get bows rather than swords. Swords are no good to you when you're making a ranged attack. Bows are no good to you when you're making a melee attack. But in each case, the defender is still going to be looking for shields in order to not get killed. Now, one thing that's worth noting here is, you'll, as you can see by looking at this table, there are only two bows, there are three swords, and there are two shields. What this means is melee is, generally speaking, die for die, going to be more effective than blocking. So an equal number of dice generally favors the attacker in terms of producing damage rather than the defender. And bows are going to be less effective in general than melee. Ranged is less effective than melee die for die in terms of producing damage because you have only a 1 in 3 chance of rolling a bow. You have a 1 in 2 chance of rolling a sword. In other words, 33% chance of rolling a bow, 50% chance of a sword, and again, a 33% chance of rolling a shield 1 in 3. You are also going to be rolling cheese once in a while and that's going to factor into the game big time, but we'll come back to the cheese mechanic later. It is a big deal that there's a cheese on this die, but generally speaking in combat it's not going to do very much most of the time, except in special circumstances as far as who's getting hit or killed. It has um, consequences outside of that particular calculation. All right, so let's talk these special abilities. And I'll just pick Colin here randomly because he's the leader, so he gets all the press. Um, the basic idea with abilities is your mice are going to, as they level up, accrue a bunch of special things that they can do. And these are uh, going to cover a, a pretty wide range of different things that they can do. Some, rec you know, more or less affect or replace an attack or 
give them something they can do instead of an attack, or they might do something as abstruse as giving them something that they can use to interrupt uh, another uh, enemy's turn or something along those lines. So they, they do a lot, and basically in each case you're going to have a card with a bunch of text on it, and you really just have to follow the instructions on the card itself to know more or less how they work. So there's not a lot to do. They're all, I mean, the, the, as I said, they cover a lot of different uh, things that you might be able to do within the mechanics of the game. So there's a broad range of things that they cover. So we're not going to sit here and go through all of them. To get an idea of the kinds of things that they do, if you are going to look at something like maybe Battle Squeak, a very vanilla ability. Um, if you look at this card, you see it's got the name, it's got a class listing, it's got a number next to a wedge of cheese, and then text about the the way the card works. And that's pretty much how all of these are going to um, be set up. And here's how you basically read these cards. Auto Squeak obviously is the name of the skill. Your class is going to be a restriction on who can use it. So basically, this is who can possibly learn or take this ability um, from the beginning. And that's going to be based on their class. And the class, again, is listed on the character's card. Now, the cheese rating is essentially how much cheese you have to spend in order to be able to activate the skill. So the usage of the ability is, in this case, going to cost one cheese. For backslash, it's one cheese. For first aid, it's two cheese, right? Uh, for Inspire, it's two cheese, and so on and so forth. You might have a uh, something like Thunder Squeak, which has a question mark ne next to the cheese, and this is because the amount of cheese you are going to spend will vary situationally. But again, you read the card, and it's pretty clear how it works. So let's go back really quickly to Battle Squeak. This is available to the Warriors. Therefore, it's available to Colin and to Nez, who are the two Warriors in the party. Why does it say Warrior instead of Colin and Nez? Well partly, I guess mainly, to make room for expansions where they might add warrior characters, giving them the ability to take a look at this as a skill for them. So this card is going to say, you may use this ability at any time during this mouse's turn until the end of this turn, whenever this mouse makes a melee attack, add one to its battle during that attack. So in other words, you spend one cheese to roll an extra die when your guy attacks. It's not going to cost an action, but in order to receive the benefit, you of course have to attack. So I guess you could spend cheese on this and not do anything with it. Um, but because you can use it at any point during your turn, you might as well wait until you need it to spend it. So effectively, it's when you attack, add a cheese. Uh, for the cost of a cheese, add a die to that attack. That's more or less how it plays out. I guess the wording on this leaves it open that if you are able to somehow make multiple attacks, then you would be able to add one die to each of them because it lasts for the end of his turn, right? But it's worth noting that even if there are skills that allow you possibly to make multiple attacks, like Filch has a skill called Knife Strike that allows him to make multiple attacks in certain situations. There is one really important restriction on abilities that bears mentioning here, and that is that you can only spend, for your entire party, you can only activate one special ability per turn on the initiative cycle. So Colin on his turn can spend uh, cheese to activate Battle Squeak, but then he can't use any of those, his other abilities. Moreover, none of the other characters, if they have a interruption ability or something like that that they might want to trigger, if Colin's already used Battle Squeak, they can't use it. And that goes for the enemies as well, which is important, because if an enemy's taking a turn, you might have a couple of people who could interrupt or do something during the middle of the enemy's turns. And this is not per enemy, it's per initiative card, per count in the initiative order. So if somebody uses an interrupting skill when the first of a pack of minions is moving, well, that means at that point nobody else is able to do that until the initiative has advanced to the next person. So something to bear in mind there. This is going to have a good deal of a impact on the game, I have found, when 
for instance, you use a uh, particular skill that Colin has that I particularly love, and that's give order. Essentially, it's and, and the wording on this is a little bit ambiguous. It says you may use this ability instead of moving this mouse. It doesn't say as you know, spend your move to activate this. It says instead of moving. So depending on how you read that, you could read that as intending to, to say that you're spending a move action to activate this, so you still have your regular action. But you could also read it as you're not allowed to move if you use this skill. So, you know, your, your mileage may vary depending on how you're reading it. But essentially, he's either not moving or spending his move to activate this. And what it does is it gives a different mouse on the tile the, the opportunity to perform one action. And that might be an attack, for instance. So let's suppose we're in a situation where Nez has Battle Squeak, right? Nez has taken it because he's a warrior. And Colin has give order, and Colin spends give order on his turn to give Nez an attack. Well, it's not Nez's turn in initiative. Nez is just allowed to take an action on Colin's turn. But Colin, on his turn, has already used an ability in order to give Nez an attack. Therefore, Nez, with his attack, he might be able to, he's still going to be able to attack, but he can't, in conjunction with that attack, activate Battle Squeak because Colin has already done it. Moreover, the ability says you can activate it during your turn and it technically isn't his turn. So there's a number of reasons why he wouldn't be able to do that. Now each mouse is going to begin play with one ability. So, you know, again, given that some of the abilities can be taken by multiple mice and there's only one ability card there to be, as it were, fought over, you sometimes are going to have to make decisions about who can take what if multiple people want access to a given ability. You're going to have to decide that as a party. It's a co-op game, so you should be kind of playing nice with one another. One thing to bear in mind is as you go through the game, though, you're going to be leveling up. And leveling up in this game consists of really nothing more than adding additional skills. So Basically, when you level up your character, you started with one ability, you just add another ability, and you can select from the pile of abilities that are available given your class and other restrictions. As a result, what will happen is by, you know, even halfway through the campaign, probably most, if not all, of the abilities will have been claimed by the mice. What will then happen is you've got a whole bunch of mice with a whole bunch of abilities. Before that starts to strike you as s extremely overpowered, bear in mind, one, that most of these abilities, if not all of them, require you to spend cheese. And if you're firing off abilities left and right, you aren't going to have much cheese left for much of anything. So you're going to run out of cheese and start running on empty and not have the ability to use abilities pretty quickly. But on top of that, because of the restriction we just outlined, detailing that the uh, the mice is, uh, you know, you're only allowed to use one ability on each tick of the initiative. So essentially on your turn, you have to pick which ability you're using. And you don't have too many that allow you to act outside of your turn. So as a result, you are not going to be able to activate a whole bunch of skills just because you have a whole bunch of skills. As a result, your mice are not getting essentially more powerful per se, although they are getting much better but it's more in virtue of them being, for want of a better word, more versatile than, you know, necessarily stronger. You're, you know, from tile number one, Nez Knight might be doing the, you know, biggest damage he's ever going to do in the entire campaign because he took one of his, you know, he took Battle Squeak right off the bat. And, you know, unless he ups his weapon, which I don't think there's anything more than a plus two, so unless you're giving him something that otherwise raises his attack. He's rolling five dice when he activates Battle Squeak, but is not really doing anything else beyond that. Uh, and you could do that again on the first tile of the game, on the first chapter of the game. So, you know, he's not, he's not swinging any harder in Chapter 10 necessarily than he is in Chapter 1. But in Chapter 10, he might also have access to first aid and protection skills and things like that that allow him to fire off abilities in other situations beyond 
simply crushing a little bit harder when he swings his hammer. So as you level up, you're going to get you know, more, more flexible. You're going to be able to do more things. You will certainly have more opportunities to spend cheese, and therefore you'll, you'll, you'll be looking to get more cheese uh, that much more desperately as you go forward. But you're not getting significantly you know, more bang for your buck on a turn-by-turn -turn basis in terms of things like your damage output or anything like that. And this is by design. This is so that, you know, Chapter 10 can be played as a one-off with your basic vanilla characters without having gone through the campaign and leveled up. And it's not going to be significantly harder than it would be if you played through the game and got to Chapter 10 towards the end. It will be easier because your mice will have abilities that they wouldn't have otherwise had. They will have that flexibility. And they might be carrying with them a couple of items, but those two are restricted, as we'll find out. So as a result, you'll be stronger in Chapter 10, having gone through a campaign, but not massively so. All right, so let's talk character cards and stats. You're going to have in front of you a character card for each mouse that you're controlling. And again, you know, you might have four people playing the game and four mice in the party, but you might be um, playing with just two or even solo and running all the mice in the party yourself. Now, each card is going to have a little bit of a uh, flavor text on the back, but the front is going to contain the information you're going to be using in-game. It's, of course, going to have a portrait. It will list the number of hearts here, which is your hit points or the number of wounds you can take before you're captured. You'll have a special ability listed on the card. It will actually re lay it out, and it'll say something like this. For instance, Colin's ability is that one placing cards on the initiative track. And that is um, basically when you're, when you're reshuffling and placing all the cards, not simply adding cards to the initiative track, but when you're placing the cards on the initiative track. If Colin is not first in initiative, he gets a cheese, which is kind of nice. Um, you're going to have four core stats. And um, I just have here, this is how many wounds he's taken, how much cheese he's got. I'm going to list his abilities down here, his equipment down here, and the stuff he's carrying around as extra items in his backpack over here as they come up. So he's got starting equipment, and that too will be listed on your card uh, what your starting equipment would be. And Colin's going to start with a sword and one of the three leather breastplates in the deck. But let's talk stats. Basically, you have four stats. You've got your battle stat, your defense stat, your lore, and your movement stat. We've already talked about movement. There's really not much more to it than that, except I think there's one item in the game that references your movement stat as a requirement for being able to use that item. But for the most part, it's just how far you move. Your battle stat is pretty obvious. It's the number of dice you're going to roll when you make an attack. And then that might be adjusted by your item. For instance, Colin's sword, you can see here, it's listing a sword in the top right corner, which is indicating that it's a melee weapon. And it has a plus one there, saying that you're going to add that one die to the two he's already rolling because of his battle stat. So when he makes an attack with this weapon, he's going to roll three dice, looking to roll swords because it's a melee uh, uh, item. It also is listing here that it's a sharp weapon, and that is not usually going to matter too much, but it might make reference uh, or need to be referenced when referencing certain abilities, such as the backslash ability, which requires you to be wielding a sharp weapon. Similarly, you have a defense stat, and that tells you how many dice you roll when defending, looking for shields. And once again, he's got an item that gives him a plus one to that. Now you notice you're, you're, you've got a battle here and it has a sword, but that battle is going to be a number that you apply to all of your attacks, whether they're ranged or melee. And so if you're someone like Lily, you are going to have a bow, which indicates that it's a ranged. It doesn't have a plus one, so when she makes an attack with that bow, she's just rolling her battle value, which is two. So she's rolling two looking for bows, and swords wouldn't help her. Then you have a lore stat. Lore doesn't, generally speaking, affect too many roles outside of a couple of skills or abilities, um, but it is also going to serve very often as a prerequisite for things like whether you're not able to use a scroll or some other item that might have a lore requirement. And then, of course, there are going to be some abilities such as Maginos's, um, you know, Chain Lightning or Mystic Bolts or something like that that are going to 
do damage or roll a number of dice according to the amount of lore that he's got. And those are basically your four stats. Not a lot to it than that. So as I mentioned, each mouse is going to start with starting gear. And I've already got it pre-programmed here, but again, you're going to find that listed on your card. And each one of these items, even the starting items, are going to be in the search deck. So they're going to have a big S on the back. And basically, they're all going to come in one big pile. And in order to get ready for the fight, for to start a chapter, you're going to have to root through that pile to find the specific, specific items and outfit your mice accordingly before you then shuffle it up to randomize it for play during the game. But uh, each mouse is going to start with starting gear. And again, it's listed on the card, so there's no real getting it wrong. You'll note, though, that Colin has... Um, even though it's Colin's sword and it is listed in his starting equipment and therefore he has to start every chapter in possession of this and that includes during the campaigns. Um, so as, as you go forward to the next chapter he might be able to carry a better weapon with him but he's always going to start with his um, starting gear in his possession at all times. Now it's also got this interesting facet here on the bottom where it has a requirement for him and you'll notice it's listing his requirement uh, for this item is that the the person using it must be a warrior. Well, that means Nez can use it. So the question might be, naturally, can you trade items and give other people your starting gear? And the answer is absolutely yes. Colin could give Nez his sword if for some reason, um, maybe Nez just really wanted to use backslash. Colin could give up a sword. If Colin got a better sword, maybe he wants to give Nez that ability just as an option. Or it gives a filch an extra attack or something like that. There's any number of uh, situations where that might happen. But you can't really depend on it too much because, again, as you go to the next chapter in a campaign, if you are progressing, you're going to have to keep returning that sword to Colin. Now, it's, it's not that hard for him to pass it off again because, as we know, trading or sharing is a free action. But it's, it's worth bearing in mind that it keeps going back to Colin. And that's going to be how you deal with starting gear. Now, how do you add gear? Well, the primary way in which you're going to be adding gear is by the search action, which we already outlined. We'll talk about exactly how searches get executed in just a bit. But basically, when you search, you're going to be drawing cards, and they're going to be sometimes nasty things, sometimes good things, sometimes events, sometimes items for the whole party, but every once in a while it might be, say, a breastplate or a shield or something else that might be useful. That mice, uh, that mouse that found it might not be able to use it, but he can still hold on to it and give it to a friend who then can equip it and start using it. A couple of things to bear in mind here. One, before you equip it, not before possessing it, but before equipping it, you do have to check whether or not you're able to use the darn thing. And that's why each one of these has a requirement on the bottom. So the breastplate requires a warrior or healer or tinkerer. So that's basically three of your six mice in the game. The other three aren't allowed to use it. So you have to check that availability, but it doesn't mean somebody else couldn't carry it. So suppose they find it and they wanted to give it to somebody or they wanted to portage it from one person to another, you could do that as well. Now, you also have a backpack where you're going to be able to store items. So suppose Colin has gone on a searching binge and he, he finds a spear and a shield and a breastplate and a helmet, right? So he's found four items, okay? If he's not equipping some of those, he actually can't carry all three of them in his pack. There are all four of them. He can carry up to three things in his pack. Now, the way you're going to have this at table, of course, is you're going to have your character card, and then you're going to have a bunch of search deck cards in front of you, and you're going to have to try to keep track of which ones are equipped and which ones are merely in your pack, however you want to do it, whether you're twisting them sideways or tucking them under your card or however you're doing it. But basically, you are going to be able to carry three things in addition to what you have equipped, and that is what the function of the backpack is, the pack. Now, that is going to include things like scrolls and potions and, you know, other, other things that you might be carrying around that you're not ever equipping. But it's also going to include weapons that you're not equipping. Um, and it's also not going to include 
things like tricks that you still can keep from mouse to mouse and actually trade from mouse to mouse. So again, we'll get into some of the things later on, but it's worth noting that you do have a pack where you can carry gear around. As a way of limiting somewhat what you can carry around, you're only allowed to carry around three items. In other words, things that kind of commonsensically would take up space. But there are going to be other search cards in addition to that that you can wander around with and effectively be, as it were, carrying more than three things besides your equipment. It's a little bit weird, but it certainly makes sense once you get into the game. You've got space for three items in your pack, and then you can also carry tricks and things of that nature that don't take up space, and you can carry as many of them as you like. Let's get into now the subject of life and death, or I guess in this case, defeat, capture, and the like, because if we're all family friendly here. Um, life and death more or less like works like this. I've already mentioned more or less hit points, if you're familiar with that concept and the number of wounds you can take. And I mentioned that minions die usually with one hit. Basically, you're gonna have a character card in front of you and you're gonna be dropping hearts on there to represent wounds. And there's a little cardboard chits basically in the shape of hearts. Uh, in, in this game, what I'm gonna be doing is just clicking on the manage wounds to add a couple of hearts. And it's gonna show up on the token, it's gonna show up on the initiative, and it's gonna show up in the party status window. And that's gonna give me a number of places where I can have a quick visual. Um, even in the, the pop-up here, it's going to show up there under injury, two out of three. So in this case, Colin would be really close to getting captured because if he takes one more wound, he's out of the fight. Now, there's one really important distinction to make when it comes to hit points, especially for your mice. If I take regular wounds, which is most of what we're going to be taking, that's one type of wound. I can also take poison wounds. And there's a couple of things to mention here, but the big difference between a poison and a regular wound is just primarily that a poison wound is harder to get rid of. That's the primary reason that it exists. It's harder to heal, there's fewer ways to get rid of it, so they're stubborn. They don't count for any more or do anything like that, but you do still total all of your poison and regular wounds towards your hit point total. So if Colin takes two regular wounds and a poison wound, he's out. So it's three wounds in total, and that's why I've got his injury here set to three, even though one's poison and two are regular. As I said, minions, generally speaking, are gonna be killed with one hit point every once in a while. Uh, and I didn't even list hit points for the rats, but if I mouse over the spider here, you can see his injury is listed as zero out of three. That again is gonna be on his initiative card. He's gonna have three hearts on his card. That would be your heads up to the fact that it's gonna take three wounds to kill him. And similarly in this game, I'm gonna be able to just simply give them wounds accordingly and it'll show up on their token as well. Now there's no facing in this game, so you're gonna be moving around and if Colin's up here and he's getting flanked or mobbed or however he might be uh, thrown into danger and imperiled, He's, you're, you're never gonna have to worry about advantages for getting mobbed or flanked or anything like that. You're just going to be taking wounds and dealing with that accordingly. Now, when you're making melee attacks, you have to be in the same space or adjacent to the space. And we talked about the adjacency test being whether you can span the space um, and then also whether you're not going through red lines and you're not going through walls and things like that. Potentially looking at um, and making decisions as a group about objects on the map. Um, so there's, there's, you know, in terms of life and death and getting through combat, uh, we've gone through most of what plays into it. We've got abilities that might add or subtract dice. We've got items that are going to be adding dice potentially. We've got defense rolls, and you're just comparing and applying wounds and divvying things up accordingly. And people are falling as they take the requisite number of wounds. It's relatively simple mechanically. And without any facing or anything like that, um, you don't have too much going on in terms of overall strategy, but there is still a lot of strategy and decision making to go into as you're taking 
your turns through the game. For instance, you're going to be making decisions time and time again about whether you hold back and kind of plink away with just a couple of ranged attacks or whether you pile in with your heavy hitters and try to take the enemy out quick. You're going to be possibly be able to block enemy movement or exploit the AI by moving someone in a particularly clever way to pull enemies away from an imperiled character or prevent them to close with an imperiled character. You're going to maybe potentially consider keeping a minion alive extra time and risking the damage he might do to you as a result of it in order to get some extra searches in without advancing the timer. You're going to have to choose which abilities to give to which mouse, and that has some long-term ramifications. You might be making a decision on chapter in Chapter 1 that you're, you're making the way you're making it in Chapter 1 because of a consideration about what's going to need to happen in Chapter 6. So there is a good bit of strategy and planning involved here if you want to take the time to reckon with it. Right, so where are these enemies even coming from in the first place? Well, the primary way in which a encounter has begun is going to happen um, basically whenever you enter a tile phase for the first time. Um, you're going to, as the first step, whenever you're either beginning a chapter, which will always be on a tile face, or when you explore, whether by flip space or by going through um, the edges of the tile to an adjacent tile, you are going to be entering a tile for the first time. And what will happen is you are going to reference, first of all, the storybook to see if that tile has special rules or a special setup. And in the, in the ch case of chapter one, you see here the setup for the first room. You're going to have three rats spread out across the three different mini and entry spaces. And that's always the setup for the first room in chapter one. That's just how it always works. So because there is a special setup for that room, you're not doing anything else. You're just going through and you're playing. The other way in which you're going to have an encounter is the first time you go to a, a tile. So suppose we finish this first tile and then we make use of this, what's called a flip space. And this is basically a place where I go onto the flip space and I explore. And that will prompt me to flip the tile over and see what's on the bottom. Then I drop down onto the associated flip space on the other side. Well, if there are no special rules for the setup of that tile in the storybook, then in virtue of the fact that I'm entering the tile for the first time and it lacks any special rules, what I would do at that point would be to draw an encounter card. That encounter card is going to list a bunch of pages with associated enemies. It's going to declare whether or not it's got a special characteristic as part of it. And it's also going to list a surge. So let's talk about each one of these aspects in its turn. I've already detailed in our discussion of initiative what the ambush is like. And again, all that does is basically advance the enemies after shuffling, advance them on the initiative track so they can tend to go sooner than you. The other thing that might show up here is mouse traps. And mouse traps are basically something that would show up if the tile has an X on it. For each X, you would place a mouse trap, and there are rules in the rule book that are pretty straightforward about how the mouse traps work. And that's basically if you dare to cross them and you're not immune to them, then you have to roll and see if you get through unharmed. Otherwise, it might knock you down and hurt you um, and also give you a cheese because I guess you took the bait. Um, importantly, when it comes to the mouse traps, the enemies ignore them, just as a side note. Now, not all encounter cards will say ambush on them. I'll show you a couple more. This one does say ambush. This one says mousetrap. Some of them say nothing, as this card here. What you're going to do when you draw the encounter card is you're going to discard any face-up encounter cards that were previously there. And you're going to have this encounter card face up somewhere. I just put it on top of the encounter deck. And then I have a discard pile off to the side. But basically, when you draw that encounter card, you're going to reference what page of the story you're on. If you're on page one, you're going to refer to page one. Page three, you're going to refer to page three, and so forth. I don't find that, certainly for every encounter card, it's not the case that every single page that has a higher number is a worse encounter. 
but it's also not true that they're easier. It's they're somewhat randomized. And that's kind of the point of the cards and the page reference on the cards. And that is to kind of just give a little bit of variety without having to print a whole bunch of encounter cards. Basically, you get almost the effect of six cards for one in terms of a variety of enemies or encounters you might have uh, the way this is built up. Because generally speaking, you're going to be getting to page three or four in pretty much every chapter, possibly higher. So later rooms in the, in the game, you're going to be pulling the centipedes and spiders on this card. Now, because we're on page one, if this was our card, we pull five greedy roaches. If we're on page two, three rats, etc. And then there are rules for how you place the enemies, which we'll get to in a bit. Then there's a surge, and the surge is what happens when you cheese the wheel. And again, we'll talk about cheesing the wheel in a second, but one of the effects of having a surge is you're going to add enemies to the battle. Now, if you're doing it as a, on the basis of a surge while combat is in effect, there will be enemies on the initiative track. So if the new enemy that you're adding requires you to add a card to the initiative track, then you would be putting them on the bottom of the initiative track. And for surges on an ambush card, you're not using the ambush rules when you add them. You're just still putting them at the bottom. Okay, so let's walk through a couple of examples. Suppose you're on page four on your encounter. You have three rats. If you haven't killed them all, then the two rats that you're bringing in are not activating on a different initiative count or anything like that. They're just, they're not adding a new card. So they, you just pile on the mini, the minis onto the map and you keep going. If, however, you had just roaches on the map and then you added rats, that would require you to add the rat initiative card to the bottom of the initiative track. And again, then you would just proceed as you had. Now, there is one thing to remember about surges. First of all, when you trigger a surge on a tile, the first thing you do is actually not check the encounter card if there is a, even is one, but you're actually going to check again the storybook and make sure there are no special rules for the tile that you're on in terms of the surges. If there are special rules for the surges, then every time you trigger a surge, you follow those and you do not use any surge effects listed on any encounter cards that might be in play. And as a result, you just keep triggering that surge, that special surge for that tile as many times as you trigger surges. By contrast, if you have no special rules for the tile, when you trigger a surge, you're going to reference your face up encounter card and place enemies accordingly. Then in the wake of resolving that surge, you will then discard that face up encounter card. And as a result, you will no longer have a face up encounter card. And if you should trigger another surge on that tile, no additional enemies would be placed. So once again, if there are special rules, it might trigger multiple, and that might require you to place enemies multiple times because of the special rules for that particular tile. If your surge is on the basis of an encounter card, you're going to add enemies only once, at which point you'll discard the, discard the encounter card, and you'll not be placing any further enemies. Okay, so let's walk through this. Let's just suppose we're on page two so that the the rats here make sense. Let's suppose our party has explored onto this tile and we have the encounter card right here, our most current encounter card, which has the three rats. So let's suppose we're on page two, and just for the sake of verisimilitude here. Okay, so let, let's suppose we're on page two. Then we drop in here. We've got three rats as our encounter. These three rats are here. It's actually the same encounter as last time. That's not a big deal. Um, so now let's suppose that as we go about our business in this fight, let's suppose that we kill one rat and he goes away. Okay, and we're moving around, we're doing our thing, we're taking wounds. We just haven't been able to kill these rats. They've been very stubborn, and then boom, we trigger a surge. Okay, on this particular card, it would require us to place two more rats. Boom and boom. And we're off to the races once again. That would not require adding any cards to the initiative or anything. We would just have the one rat in our initiative at that point. Okay. Now, 
at that point, we would then discard our current encounter card. So suppose we then went about our business fighting these guys and, you know, just a whole lot of cheese was rolled by the bad guys or what have you. I got a Colin got captured and a bunch of bad stuff happened and boom, I've got a surge. Well, at that point, a surge is triggered, but no enemies are added because we no longer have an encounter card and we don't have any special rules for this tile, as I've said. Well, then what gives what's the point of a surge who cares at that point well the big thing with the surge is that in addition to the enemy showing up one of the big effects is that when you trigger a surge you advance the page of the current story and you're ticking closer and closer to the end so again backing up suppose when i came in here i was on page two and i triggered a surge adding more enemies that prompted me to tick up a page when Colin was captured, that's going to prompt me to tick up a page on the timer. If I trigger another surge, even though I'm not placing enemies, it's still real bad because I'm triggering yet another advancement of the page. And all of a sudden, before you know it, I'm on page five. And if I get one more, I'm up to page six. That's at this point in this chapter, you're pretty much dead because there's no way you're going through four or five tiles with just one page to go it's just good freaking luck <laughs> it's not going to happen um so th this point if i'm on tile two and i'm already up to page five i might call it at that point um depending on how interested i was what what level of macabre interest i had in seeing just how far i could get before i got torn to shreds um, but that's basically how surges work you either follow the special rules or you follow the encounter card the encounter card's always going to involve adding enemies. The special rules often will. The encounter card gets discarded, but every time, even if you're not adding enemies and there's no special surge, there's no other consequences, you're always advancing the page. And that's always bad because that is your ticking clock on winning or losing the chapter. So you have to be very mindful of that in even the very early tiles of the game. Now, let's speak again of this capture thing. Again, really quickly, the, en the enemies, the minions, are when they're defeated, they're just removed from the map and there's no other consequences. When one of the mice is defeated, they are what is called captured. So suppose, coming back to what I said, Colin was captured. The first thing that happens when you have a capture is you advance the page. And again, that's very, very bad. Now, Colin is not out for the rest of the game. He is out for the rest of that fight, however couple of things happen immediately upon getting captured. The first thing is, again, you advance the page timer. Second thing is you go ahead and you clear any cheese that he might have had. You're also going to clear him of any wounds or injuries or status effects like being webbed or anything like that. You basically just kind of wipe him out as though he was about to start brand new all over again. But if he had any equipment, not in his pack, but actually equipped that was not his starting gear, that is lost. I guess the idea is the rats capture him, they take his stuff, but you're never gonna send him back into the fray without his starting gear. So he's gonna keep any starting gear that he has. He's also gonna keep anything that was hidden in his pack because the rats are too dumb to search him. So sometimes it's actually a tactic to put away your best weapon in the event that you might get captured so that you don't lose it going forward into the next chapter or the next room and so forth. You're also, again, you're going to wipe out any cheese and you are going to be out of the encounter. The only way you're going to be coming back is if the remaining members of your party then win the fight. What happens then is, as we've noted, you, even if all the enemies are taken out of the fight, you are still going to be adding or going, going through the initiative out of combat to determine who's going where, how quickly you're going through it. And again, every time you cycle through the rotation, you're adding cheese to the wheel if there's no bad guys around, forcing you to keep moving. But one of the nice things that, uh, or one, one of the good things that happens when you finish a combat is if you hang out until Colin's turn, the captured mouse's turn comes around again, as long as there are no bad guys on the map, then Colin is considered to have been rescued and he can return to the game. 
he's going to return uninjured and cheeseless with again potentially having lost some items and you will have advanced the chapter and he wasn't available for far, for um, part of the fight that you were in but it's still going to be the case that he's able to come right back once that fight is over and continue through the game so it's not like somebody's going to lose their mouse on tile one and have to sit there and watch the rest of their friends finish the game out he's going to keep again his starting gear anything he had in his pack and he will not lose any of his abilities no matter how many times he's leveled up so he's still you know a wizened and cagey veteran of the fray no matter how many times he's been captured all right so let's dive into one of the surprisingly large elements of the game and that is searching um, First of all, in order to search, basically you're going to spend your action and you're going to be obviously somewhere on a tile. That might or might not be a special search area. We'll come back to that. But basically when you decide to search, what you're going to do is roll a die, uh, skills notwithstanding, abilities notwithstanding. And on a roll of a star, which if you recall is a 50% chance because three of the six sides of the die have a star on them, if you roll any star, you succeed in your search. The typical result of succeeding in a search is you draw the top card from the search deck and generally speaking it's a good thing for you so as a result searching generally speaking tends to be a good idea if you have the spare time for it. The things that you can get include loot and equipment and things like that. It might be boons, um, activities, events, special items, story items, all kinds of things that are all good for you or they could be something unfortunate, um, a treachery card, um, something, you know, costs you cheese, that sort of thing. Um, there's even one card in there that is an automatic capture, which can be very bad. Um, the types of events that, or sorry, the types of cards that you get when you search are broken up into the following categories. First, you have events. These are things that you play immediately, either they might be good or bad so let me just actually pull this up and we can kind of look at a couple of these some fortune cards include let's see uh, cheese cheese cash is a fortune card you play it immediately as soon as you draw it and each mouse on the tile gets one cheese so just basically you pull it up you, you, you search and you found a bunch of cheese you divvy it up into the party you can also get well that's not a fortune card that's not an event let's see we've got um, something bad moldy cheese would be a treachery card but again it's kind of an event because you play it immediately just takes place immediately and in this case you basically whoever performed the search finds that their cheese is moldy and they must discard all their cheese so if you have a stockpile of 10 cheese that's a real bad card to get if you've only got one it's really not that big a deal um, the other things, of course, that you can get are things like your, your armor and your weapons. So you might get a leather breastplate, you might get a longbow, you might get a sword, etc. You might get an amulet you can equip, so on and so forth. You might also get items, uh, expendable items, usable items like scrolls and things like that. You've got, uh, let's see if I can find one, heal all is a scroll. And that, again, is going to be an item that it's not equipable but it does take up space in your pack and it's a free action to use just like all the scrolls are unless they say otherwise and uh, you just basically get the effect but you have to have two lore in order to use it you can also get things party items like the grape or the fish hook and thread which is a very very handy item to have those then go into the party stash as opposed to taking up space in your pack uh, I mentioned scrolls, and then the last thing you can get are tricks, such as the always lovely tail link. And these again are just tricks that you can get that you can hold on to. They don't take up space in your pack, but they are kind of somewhat like events that you can choose when to trigger, if you want to put it that way. Um, tail link is a good example of this. It's one that um, you can play under certain circumstances and basically get a free kill which is kind of nice but only against relatively weak enemies all in all when you wind up surveying all of the potential search cards that you can get 
I have counted up about 90% of the time the card is good for you, um, or at least no doesn't hurt you. 10% of the time it's going to be bad. You can again carry three items in your pack in addition to any gear that you have equipped, and tricks are not counted. Not events, good stuff you can choose to discard for a cheese instead. So when you draw a card like Cheese Cash, it says play immediately, you get it, you resolve the action. You get a card that you, you know, causes you to lose your cheese, you get moldy cheese. You play that immediately, you take the effects. But if you pull a trick, if you pull a scroll, a potion, a piece of equipment, anything that isn't, you know, kind of a play immediately or a bad card, you can choose to, instead of taking that card, you can immediately discard it and get a cheese instead. So you're searching, and as long as you don't get something bad, kind of worst case scenario, you get a piece of cheese out of it, which is always nice to have. You have one very important rule to follow when you're doing the searching, and that is that there is a limitation of one successful search per mouse per tile face. In other words, and generally speaking, you don't usually return to tile faces, so you can kind of just keep track of it as they come. But generally speaking, you go into a tile, and each mouse can successfully search on that tile once only. They can keep searching until they successfully search, but once they've done so, you can't keep searching with that mouse. And this is a way to just prevent you from kind of hanging out and burning time and just loading up on loot as soon as you clear a tile. So you have to make sure that you're keeping track somehow, and the way that the framework is going to do that, which you'll see as we go forward, is if I just roll a search and I, I got a success, so I would then draw a search card and just randomly get, just happen to draw the fish hook, which is kind of nice. But notice um, I've got the little S on my colon item um, uh, avatar here, and then if I mouse over on Colin's thing it'll it'll show up there as well and that will basically tell me who has successfully searched on the tile it just populates automatically as soon as you successfully roll a search I can clear it uh, in a number of ways but as soon as I move to the next tile I have a whole new um, batch of searches that I can do on that tile so at that point I just click clear search markers and they all go away at table um, there is no marker or way of tracking this. I think on BoardGameGeek there's a um, there's there's a file where you can get the the like little S marker that I just used there for um, printing. So you can use that to put it on your card to track. I just got some colored stones from like a dollar store, and I just put colored stones on the initiative cards when a mouse has successfully searched in that tile. Um, the one thing that's a little bit hard to keep track of is if you do return to a tile, technically you could still search with mice after coming back, but generally speaking, once you leave the tile, you're now reckoning with the next tile, and it's hard to remember who searched in a tile when you come back. So what I usually do is I just say I, I have to do it on the first time, and when I come back, unless I know for sure who searched successfully, Unless I can say that for absolutely certain, I don't allow myself to continue searching when I return to a tile just so that I avoid any kind of cheating. Um, the last thing to mention here is special searches. And again, when you're referring to the storybook, every time you go to a new tile, you want to check the rules and see if there's anything about that tile in there. If there isn't, then you just go to town and everything's hunky-dory. But every once in a while, you're going to have a tile that has a special search indicated. That search might be one that takes place anywhere on the tile and it might be a place uh, one specific spot on the tile or it might be any of a number of spaces on the tile and of course you might have multiple different special search spots on the tile so basically if it, if it declares a specific location obviously you have to be on that or one of the relevant locations and then successfully search in order to get the special search you can still search in other places and do the drawing from the deck, but if you need to get uh, a special search done for whatever reason, you want to make sure not to use up your searches, and whoever's going to do the ultimate special search has to be somebody who does not successfully search somewhere else. So you have to keep track of that. Um, the one element 
in all of this that you need to kind of be aware of is that um, when in a, in a couple of situations in the storybook you have special searches that allow you to actually potentially draw one of two special items so like you might be able to pick either the fish hook or the grape right um, it and it just says fish hook or grape so a lot of people don't really know what to do basically the idea there is you can choose um, I believe you can find both but whenever you successfully search in that special search location whether it's a spot or the whole tile if it does give you options when you succeed you can pick which one you want um, it's it's basically up to you other than that there's not a whole lot more to searching it is really important it's a big facet of the game it's a good way to make sure you're continually getting either cheese or um, gear that you obviously need and while you can only carry one piece of gear from chapter to chapter as you go through a chapter you're finding more gear so you might have Colin running around with you know a sword shield a helmet and a amulet that are all benefiting him um, for the last couple of tiles of that of that chapter which is always great and then finally you have a couple of search related abilities one of the big ones for me is Filch's find ability he's got an ability here that allows him to after successfully rolling a search he may choose to spend two cheese in order to draw the top three cards from the from the search deck instead of just drawing the first one and he can pick whichever one he wants this allows him to do something really important which is avoid the negative cards and again the that abduction card is um, uh, an automatic capture which is bad because among other things it advances your page so you know it's really nice to be able to have that kind of get out of jail free card plus you can just pick your best item if you use it a few times in the course of a of a chapter you're going to be seeing that many more search cards so you have that many more chances of getting those you know favorite items that you want to be carrying with your favorite mice from chapter to chapter so the find abilities I think really really nice I try to use it especially in early chapters early on um, until I get people equipped nice and strongly and even then I like to use it when I have the cheese because again it does allow me to avoid negative cards really quickly I want to make a couple of last notes about abilities and cheese before we move on to cheese in general and uh, which is a, a big topic and then kind of wrap up a um, couple things I, I know I've said this here and there in uh, scattered about in different places but it's worth noting really important a um, couple of comments first of all each mouse begins play with one ability so you pick an ability which abilities are available to you it's going to be pretty clear because each ability lists uh, the classes that can use it or occasionally a mouse in particular that can use it um, so for instance Maginos I believe has an ability called Meeps that requires Maginos only but notice it says only as opposed to first aid which is available to any class mystic blast available to mystics invisibility mystic chain lightning mystic and as we saw before with Nez and Colin they both share a bunch of the warrior skills so you have some decision making as to who's taking what and of course the party as a whole has to decide about first aid if two people want to take the same ability you, you can't give it to both people there's one card and there's only one card that means only one person can be the holder of that card um, you would start to get some duplicates when you start introducing additional mice with expansions but even then there's not a lot so basically it's each skill there's one iteration of it one token of the type and you gotta kind of fight amongst yourselves or come to a nice gentle person's agreement about who is going to be taking charge of it um, leveling up in this game consists in spending a free action on your turn to spend six cheese which then allows you to pick yet another ability and you can rack up as many as you want again the party should generally be deciding in a co-op game who's hoarding the cheese and whether or not somebody is 
you know, accruing a bunch of cheese and not sharing it and hoarding all the abilities or something like that. If you have Maginos or Filch who can tend to be cheese magnets to a degree, if they start piling up a bunch of cheese and they start grabbing all the abilities that they possibly can, you know, that, can that could ruffle some feathers potentially. So you need to be a little bit careful about that. But basically, you just want to try to get cheese in the hands of everybody and play all the mice as you go through the campaign so that they can all wind up picking the abilities that they need to be most effective. Now, once again, these abilities are going to require cheese to activate. They can be significant. They can be very, very nice. They can be game-changing in the right situation. But for the most part, adding abilities doesn't make you so much stronger as more versatile and better able to handle different situations. So if you consider that a strength, I guess it makes you stronger, but you're not generally hitting a whole lot harder just because you have seven abilities instead of one that you start with. All right, so we wrap up with a long discussion of cheese here, basically cheese and the cheese wheel in particular. Uh, we've noted a couple of times that six cheeses, as the cheese wheel begins to fill, and remember if an enemy rolls cheese when they're attacking or defending, so we got a rat here, I'll just roll a couple, of course now I'm not rolling any cheese. Um, there we go, there's a cheese. So suppose this rat for some reason is rolling three defense and he rolls a cheese. That is going to throw a cheese onto the cheese wheel. And that as a result is going to, you know, you can you can take the cheese tokens and put them on the storyboard. When that fills up, again, you're going to trigger a surge, and we've talked about surges, okay? Uh, cheese in excess, we want to repeat, is not carried over. So if you fill up that cheese wheel, you do trigger a surge, but if you filled up the cheese wheel because you had five, and let's just say for some reason you added, let's just say a rat rolled three cheeses somehow, um, you are not going to six, resolving the surge, and then carrying over the, the next two. You actually just fill up the cheese wheel, resolve the, che the, the surge, and then the cheese wheel goes on from there totally empty. Now the next rat might add cheese to it, but if excess cheese that, that caused the, the thing to fill up, um, it, it doesn't carry over. So think of your, your, your pouring milk into a cup and it flops over, it all spills. That's more or less what you got. Important things to remember about uh, the, the cheese mechanic here. First of all, roaches, regular roaches, will take your cheese if you have any when they hit you. And greedy roaches, which are different from regular roaches, not all roaches are greedy, but greedy roaches, when they take your cheese, will add it to the wheel. So as a result, sometimes you actually want to get wounded rather than have them eat your cheese if they're greedy. But if they're regular, generally speaking, it's better to have them take your cheese than hurt you. Now, all roaches are going to be greedy in the entire game if there are any roaches anywhere in play. If the card is on the initiative track and one roach is greedy for whatever reason, whether it got added from a surge or something like that, then all the roaches are considered greedy at that point. So either all the roaches are not greedy, or they're all greedy. End of story. When you roll for cheese in attack or defense, the effect happens immediately, even before resolution of the combat itself. So if you get hit by a roach, and you do not roll any shields, but you roll a cheese, you gain that cheese before you're even hit by the attack, and as a result, you might start with no cheese on your mouse. You might have even done that intentionally because you're facing a greedy roach. But you roll cheese in defense, that roach then eats that cheese because you got it before the attack is resolved, and that cheese would then go onto the wheel. Similarly for the enemies. You might be um, wiping out an enemy. You might even be on the last tile of the chapter and you're killing the last enemy. Your last blow kills that guy. But in the process of rolling his defense, he rolls cheese and that triggers a surge, which adds enemies to the tile. You did not just win the game because those enemies and the surge get resolved before that rat is killed, if that makes sense. Filch, it's also worth noting, very important element of Filch, the character. So let's take a look at his special abilities here. He's first of all he's got the nice prehensile tail. It allows him to carry 
three weapons or a two-hander and a one-hander, as long as it's a dagger, which is his starting weapon anyway. But he also has the pilfer ability, which its basic effect is just every time he kills something, he gets a cheese, which is kind of nice. He's like looting the bodies or something. <laughs> um, but it, what's interesting is if it is a rat that he killed, then he not only is getting cheese, he's not just taking it from the stash, he's taking it off the cheese wheel if there is any cheese wheel uh, cheese available at that time. Now again, surges get triggered, so it might be that Filch does kill an enemy, but they roll cheese, trigger a surge, that surge then clears the wheel before Filch can take his cheese as a result of the kill because the surge happens before the kill does. So there's an element there. But generally speaking, Filch is able to provide a nice kind of cushion or po potential anyway of giving you a little bit more time in the chapter. Um, if I'm ever running up against surges or, or running low on the time limit, I'm usually hoping I have rats on the map and I'm doing my best to let Filch kill them because that allows me to take cheese off the wheel and potentially save my game. All right, that is pretty much all the rules and all the mechanics you need in order to get through this game. I'm gonna do a quick little summary here and that should be it. We can then roll into chapter one of our playthrough. All right, so um, here's basically how a game is gonna go. You're going to be choosing a, a scenario. It might be chapter one because you're gonna run through the entire thing or you might choose any chapter you want as a one-off. And the scenario is going to be something you're going to need to read and read through completely in order to know what's going on. Um, the scenario might restrict what options you have in your starting party. It's basically going to tell you who you can use and how many mice you can use. You're going to examine your whole chapter before you're playing again. This, this might result in uh, less tension or less surprise, but you really have to know what's going on in order to run the game effectively. It is possible to have someone kind of acting as a soft GM who is managing the game and the setup and the rules and letting people know what needs to be done without spoiling surprises for them. But generally speaking, someone at the table kind of has to know what's up. Otherwise, you're going to be fumbling a little bit too much, I find, in the story. There are going to be a bunch of story moments in the book that you can read out loud, have somebody read. You can act it out as much as you like, or you can blow through them and just stick with the story. They do, however, I find give a little bit of clarity to the rules. Um, the mechanics in a particular room make more sense if you understand what the story is at times. Party sizes are going to vary between two to six. It's always going to be an even number. You either have two, four, or six mice in your party, and sometimes your party is split. The most common is four, so the vast majority of chapters in this game are going to have four mice, um, but it's 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 worth considering this fact because it's it's a game that you can play solo. You can certainly play with two people through the entire the entire campaign and each one is running a couple of mice and things like that. But if you're planning on running a campaign with four people and each person is running a mouse, well that's not going to work flawlessly the entire way through because you're going to have chapters where there are only two mice playing. So the other people are going to be watching or maybe they don't come that night or or something. Um, and then you're also going to have chapters where you have six mice in play and even with a party of four you're going to have somebody who's going to have to double up. So it's it's not a big deal, I don't find at all, but bec if you're playing through a campaign you do have to consider, especially those chapters with just two mice, what you want the odd people out to be doing. Um, I play it solo, I play it with two people, but um, it's it's a concern when you play through the campaign. Uh, the objective is usually basically going to be get to the end of the map from where you start at and clear that tile, maybe having accomplished something along the way, but generally speaking is get to the end and, and clear the tile. In order to navigate the map, you're going to flip tiles, you're going to flip spaces, and um, you're going to look for tile connections. So you've got flip spaces, and you go on there and you do your explore action. It allows you to flip the tile and your mice move to the other side of the tile. You can also move to adjacent uh, adjacent tiles, but only when you have a colored region on the two tiles that matches. So you can't move from this room to those tunnels. You have to move 
from this tunnel room to that tunnel room. If these were both flipped over and both on the high side, this, there's an entrance from, for this room down here, but it doesn't match an entrance on this room. There is no exit out of this room going that way. So even if those two tiles are, are here, you're not going to be able to pass from one to the other. Occasionally, it will also tell you um, explicitly that you're not allowed to move or you are allowed to move in certain ways. But again, you're going to refer to the storybook for that information. Each room has an encounter, and you're going to clear the room before you move on. Sometimes it's declared by the storybook. Most of the time, it's by an encounter card. There's going to be lots of special events in the various chapters. A lot of the rooms have set encounters or potentially set a special rules. When you get to some of the expansions, those rules get nice and involved. There's, uh, there's one in Glorm that always jumps out at me where you've got big, long tiles uh, all stretching together, and you've got these big great boulders rolling back and forth, Indiana Jones style, and it's, it's, it's all involved, but once you get it figured out, it's kind of cool. You're going to have to thoroughly examine the storybook, again, to know what's going on in each cham chamber just because of all these intricacies. Every time you move to a new tile, you need to stop and check the book to see if it has any special rules. You're often going to have to reference several bits of info in order to know what you need to do. You're going to have to cross-reference a couple of different tiles uh, throughout the chapter sometimes. For example, if, if victory requires you to do X in the final room, maybe in order to accomplish X you needed to do Y earlier, maybe in a previous chapter. And so the only way to win is by doing Z instead. Maybe the previous room had you do Z in order to get to Y, y you get the idea. The campaign is going to play out over 11 chapters and the mice are going to keep learned skills and one piece of gear as they go between chapters in addition to their starting gear which they always have. Now you can trade your starting gear to another mouse but at the start of the next chapter that starting gear goes back to the original mouse. Everybody has their starting gear and up to one additional item that they're carrying with them from chapter to chapter. You do not carry over any cheese but you're going to retain all your abilities. You also are not carrying over any wounds or status conditions. Later chapters are easier in a campaign than they are standalone, but not by a lot. The main gain, as I said, when you're leveling up is versatility. A couple of things that might pass you by earlier are helpful or um, required in later chapters, and in most cases you're better off getting all the extra stuff ASAP whenever you have the option. But there's a couple of uh, examples, for example, Miss Maggie, in chapter one, depending on how you read a somewhat ambiguous rule, um, it might be better to not get Miss Maggie in the first chapter. It certainly makes the first chapter harder, um, especially if it's your first time playing through. You might want to forego it, but at the same time, because of its, it's, it's so story driven, it really doesn't feel like it's something that you should be walking past. But um, if you get it there, arguably you can't get it later, and arguably it helps you later in that later chapter more because that later chapter tends to have more of a time constraint and the reward for getting it, among other things, is moving the chapter end marker one page ahead. So that's the one place where it's not obvious that maybe you shouldn't be going for it. With that exception, I think most of the time if, you, if there's an extra thing and you think you can get it, go for it. Um, but I do think it's unfortunate that chapter one has this one thing that seems really story driven and generally speaking you're probably well advised to avoid it which is a little bit unfortunate. That, that's maybe my one real dig at this game other than you know tile after tile after tile you are slogging through the same number of enemies. I still find it completely compelling. I don't lose any of my enchantment with the game, but some people do eventually start to find it tedious. There is a lot of dice rolling. There is a lot of the same enemies coming at you again and again, but with the different scenarios, the different rules, the different setups, the different surges, the different combinations of gear and different party combos and, and everything else going on, I find that it retains plenty of freshness to go through the entire campaign multiple times over and have it still be enjoyable. And then I will say one note in parting before we close this out, and that is that the expansion packs actually augment this game enormously. They add greatly to the story, but also to the strategery that is involved. Um, strategy helps you in this game, but only uh, to a marginal degree. I think that 
in the expansion strategy is much more what I would call required for success. This, uh, you're, you're moving your odds just a little bit with good strategy there. I think it makes a larger difference to your success rate. So for better or for worse, that is my um, stance on the difficulty level of these various campaigns and, and, uh, and the base game. But the base game I find to be just absolutely enchanting. I think it's a real good time. It's a total hoot. And um, I guess I'll just wrap it up there. I will go ahead and put together a playthrough for chapter one, and you can see how this all comes together in action. Um, I recorded one version of a playthrough, and it was real long. So what I think I might do is I'll still post it. I'll post the, the, the full version, and it's real long because I was going through um, some rules uh, recapping and I was talking about every strategic decision I was making in depth as kind of a tutorial. I'm not going to do that for all the chapters but I did do it for first chapter and it wound up being real long so I think I might re-record that and just have two versions of chapter one available for people to watch in case they want to watch a, just a short version see how it plays or a longer version get some explanation and, um, and advice along the way. But um, yeah we have gotten to the end of our rules tutorial. Hope you found this helpful or compelling, interesting. Um, drop a note in your comments. Uh, what do you think of the framework? Do you think Map Tool is a nice tool? Um, I find it to be very powerful. Go ahead and check it out at rptools.net and get the download. Check it out. It's a really, really nice tool. Uh, there are frameworks that are pre-put together for things like Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. Um, I can't make this available to people because of copyright restrictions on the, the Mice, and Mystics, Mice and Mystics game. But um, there's a ton of frameworks on there for, for other role-playing games and the like that are absolutely available to use. And um, it's a really powerful tool. It's really good. I strongly, strongly recommend you check it out if you do any kind of online or at-table gaming using TVs or projectors or anything like that. There's really good line-of-sight tools and things like that. All right. Uh, with that out of, the, out of the way, I will wrap this up and just say thanks a bunch for watching. I hope you found this useful. Please check a, uh, take a look at my playthrough videos. One's going to be long, one's going to be short, and then all the rest of the chapters should be a whole lot shorter. Thanks so much for watching. I will look for you in the next video. Take care.